Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and uh, one of our most amazing guests, Professor James McCanny. We have the link out for James's uh, website, jmccsci.com, which is the short version. Uh, Professor McCanny, we talked about this before the show today, and it's important to open up with this can of worms. These Italian scientists, we talked about this with Harley in the first hour, were prosecuted. I want to get your side of what you see going on here because there's some very negative things that have happened uh, and some attacks on science, but also this needs to get sorted out because it's not just going to affect earthquake science, it's going to affect science in general that's been under attack, whether it's medicine, uh, earthquake prediction science, or all kinds of space weather science, near-Earth objects, the idea that government's going black op and not providing the data to scientists like yourself or people like Stan Dale that can use it for prediction and analysis or new models. Uh, these Italian scientists that are going to jail now, this is from their higher court, so that means it's not good. Uh, what happened and why did this decision happen, and what does it mean for, quote, the attacks on science and the ability of at least some groups to get their information out rather than being muddled in a report that basically says, well, this is so confusing, we're not going to evacuate, and they don't, and 300 people die. Um, what happened? Well... The, the story is a number of years ago, a uh, earthquake in Italy, the earthquake in Italy um, killed 300 people. Uh, there were a number of uh, accredited scientists on the board of a government board, which was designed to uh, alert people of um, a impending earthquake or disaster. Uh, there was a considerable uh, previous minor earthquake activity around this one site and so um, the scientists had a kind of a confused conflicting report and then ultimately said they didn't think there was enough indication that to uh, suggest that there would be a major earthquake uh, shortly thereafter there was a major earthquake at 6.3 I believe and of course in Italy the buildings are old and so uh, uh, ultimately 300 people died uh, later, these same scientists are uh, convicted in a court and are given six years sentence uh, for... Now, you have to understand, uh, it's like sometimes people in a bad relationship. Uh, somebody does something, somebody else does something, somebody else reacts, and then, and then uh, it's like he said, she said, whatever. And so science now is saying... Uh, they're interpreting this as the first of all we don't have uh, enough data and science to predict earthquakes so they're saying well we couldn't predict it anyway but well, wait these guys took money they signed up for a government position stating that they would allegedly protect the public and then didn't do it and so their mistake was uh, taking money although this is a very strange precedent where uh, people, uh, where scientists are being convicted of uh, basically, it's, it's not due to bad science, it's due to bad communication. So I think that's where you have to differentiate. Scientists are, are taking it uh, like this. They're, they're trying to say that, um, that these scientists were convicted because they couldn't properly predict. No. They signed up for a government position to warn the public uh, later they come back and they say, we don't have any predictive value. I want to... Uh, yeah, that also is confusing because obviously whoever said that may not represent every different faction of the group that says, oh yeah, there's a number of predictive parameters that are being researched elsewhere, like here in California. Piezoelectric uh, measurement of the Italian currents of the Earth are actually implanted as along the San Andreas fault line. There's a radon capture devices that can be remotely sensed to actually tell if there's being radon released from the uh, from the earth or hydrogen sulfide or other deep gases. Uh, there's things like GPS coordinates that look at the creep of fault lines, both vertical creep as well as horizontal if there's any upthrust zones. So there's, a, there's a whole range of technologies that's being researched in other jurisdictions. So for them to say you can't predict earthquakes, uh, listening to vibration of the uh, deep earth, uh, all kinds of technologies that's actually been on the bench for years. So for them to say that it's not there when they're hundreds of years ago, they would smell before you know the Mount Vesuvius blew a deep you know hydrogen sulfide rotten egg smell, or there were other warning signs happening. It just doesn't make sense, does it? 
Well, yeah, but the, the bottom line is I don't care what science it is, uh, whether you're predicting eruptions on the sun or interactions of, of other issues. I deal with predictive things. For example, my weather work, predicting right. hurricanes. And, of course, there's always a caveat. Mm. Well, other things can happen. Other influences can come into play. Uh, 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 other parameters, yeah. Other parameters. And with geology, we don't have that much data, really, on the center of the Earth. There's, there's a lot of unknowns there. And so the, the real issue is, uh, can scientists predict? And uh, basically they cannot. But uh, this whole issue sets a precedent. I want to refer back to um, actually an article I wrote in 1999 criticizing the NOAA, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The head of the Hurricane Prediction Center was William Gray, and they were making predictions when Hurricane Floyd came into Florida uh, they, uh, it was a weekday, it was a morning, and kids were still in school. This hurricane is 190 miles offshore, and they said, well, the hurricane prediction model says it's going to go north. And so Dade County took that and did not warn anybody. If, and in fact, the hurricane did turn north and finally struck North Carolina. But let's say it didn't. Let's say something else happened, some other factor kicked in. If that hurricane would have gone inland, it would have been way worse than Andrew. The kids would have been in school. There would have been no way to get them out of there or to safe areas. Nothing in South Florida had been evacuated. In fact, Southern Florida doesn't even have an evacuation plan, if you can imagine that. But um, I criticized those people for uh, taking a chance. They rolled the dice and won. Uh, but ultimately, a year and a half ago, William Gray and his uh, sidekick, who was the head of the NOAA Hurricane Prediction Center, up and quit. And they made a very short, very brief, but very pointed announcement. They said nothing that they had done over the past 20 years in terms of predicting hurricanes, nothing they had done had any scientific value. They said they don't have any ability to predict hurricanes any more than the man of the moon and they is that to cover their uh, their butt legally because even yep. when there's science that indicates that there's pattern recognition uh you know multilinear regression analysis uh you know all kinds of technologies that basically say there's patterns there that they haven't fully teased out yet and and parameters to say a statement like that sounds like it came from an, a lawyer it didn't come from a scientist well yeah exactly and that's why i was wondering i when they did that i thought to myself good grief these guys have been at this for 20 years and every year i got on radio programs and i said these guys are they're they're, they're quacks they don't have and i looked at the factors in their model none of them had anything to do with hurricane prediction uh right now tell yeah. give an example let's use your example because you do hurricane prediction what model do you use and what kind of parameters have you teased out that you think are useful to determine the strengths, direction, and the relative uh, pathway, whether it's going to go from a category X to category Y or Z? Uh, a hurricane is actually formed from electrical currents that come from the ionosphere and ultimately from electrical currents that are passing by Earth every day in outer space. When these right. change rapidly or there's other factors, augmented electrical currents, then that affects our, our geomagnetic field, which drops down to the ionosphere and pulses, and there's, all, there's a whole series of factors that eventually cause storm systems to go turn into hurricanes. Right. Uh, the, so it's right, like the one with, uh, with the uh, Katrina, where for over a week they were watching and seeing the storm cells on Doppler radar start to collect together, which means there's ionospheric and plasma effects in the upper atmosphere that they're in real time watching before it actually collected together with many of these storm cells building into a giant vortex that was pulling in these storm cells to be a giant hurricane. We come back more with Professor James McCanny on uh, how to do real science and how to communicate. Welcome back, and uh, while we're on the break, we get into an important discussion. We want to roll it back and uh, talk about this. Uh, Dr. McCanny, this is an area that you have a great deal of expertise in, and I call it very accurate wisdom on this, 
Tier 1 science is black op projects that have infinite budgets and virtually no ethical restraint on anything they do, whether it's military weapon systems, imaging technologies, or information gathering. Tier 2 science are public scientists at universities, scientists like yourself out in the community, people even contracted with the government to do a specific project, may have a limited budget, often working together with all the access to this black op Tier 1 science information, which is a huge giant information source, because they've had infinite budgets basically for a century or more, the result is that they have a giant database that never gets access to the public. Just like, for example, one department of the government, like the Department of the Navy or the Space uh, Technology, will not pass information on to even another department. So if you're looking for information, say, for a near-Earth object, you're not going to get that anymore. That's now considered classified information. You're not getting information about a red dwarf star. Or if they do have collaborative projects with uh, Tier 1 scientists in Japan three years ago when they put up the geomagnetic satellite to look at the Earth's magnetosphere as a predictive factor for earthquakes, because before the Santiago quake, we had a giant disappearance of the Sol's magnetic pole. It disappeared completely for a period of uh, more than a day before the Santiago quake struck. So uh, what we have here is Tier 1 science does whatever they want, and Tier 2 science is now under attack. Uh, draw this out and explain exactly how serious this is in terms of these scientists being literally the scapegoat for politicians and other people, and actually maybe... A, a, an attack to destroy tier 2 science altogether so that unless it can be politicked uh, uh, which it always is we can't have disparate opinions even among a group that presents a, a paper it's very dangerous isn't it yeah absolutely Yeah, the, uh, let's explain uh, just very clearly tier 1, tier 2 science it's something I've been hammering on with the, the, so the public understands when you see scientists like this, you imagine, well, these are, these are the top scientists in the country in Italy. And uh, no, that's not true at all. These are what I call tier two scientists. They are from universities, and uh, they're, they're really a second level of science. They uh, are, are very limited in the information they have, and they're kept there to give the illusion that they're the top layer of science. Yeah. The real top layer of science is, uh, and, and by the way, in the United States, the people you see at NASA, uh, the people you see in universities uh, around the country or teaching, say, college, university, astronomy, astrophysics, those are tier two scientists. The right. ones that are tier one, you never see their name, you never hear about them, they don't publish papers in any journal you would ever see. Their information goes up the ladder and it's used around uh, the, the controlling people of the world because they know that information is critical to their control. So they're not right. going to let the public see top-level information. In fact, they make a point to give what I call garbage science to the public. That's right. In fact, totally I, I made this quote back in my, my talks over the years that 96% of the valuable high-tech advanced scientific information and data is available to Tier 1 scientists, and only 4% is available to Tier 2 uh, and beyond. Absolutely. And so, okay, so now with that in perspective, these scientists in Italy were Tier 2 scientists. Uh, Bill Gray, with his group at NOAA predicting hurricanes, was Tier 2 scientists. They were saying that the warm water of the ocean pr provides the heat that generates the, the tremendous hurricanes that we see. Well, it's such an absurd concept yeah. That uh, that the ocean water warmth uh, creates hurricanes. I've done no. calculations, and it, it's not even one percent of the energy necessary to create a hurricane. We have uh, the greatest hurricanes in history were in the North Atlantic in November. Right. Well, the, the way you're talking about is a plasma effect, and you're the master of plasma science. Explain how your model, which is a plasma model create storms and superquake and even earthquakes are a plasma effect as well where we, that's why you right. see earthquake effect lights above fault lines before they strike like in Shenzhen and, and China that happened I think four and a half years ago they had the giant superquake there that killed 180,000 people uh, please continue yeah absolutely in these, these events not all earthquakes are caused by uh, electrical impulses from outer space there's right. a lot of activity in the ground but hurricanes, 100% of the time, are driven by electrical currents. But the point I'm making here is the Tier 2 scientists are pawning off this garbage science to the public, 
And uh, I think Bill Gray finally woke up and said, and I don't know what caused him to do this, he may have seen this kind of thing coming down the road where he would actually be responsible for their predictions. And he got up and he said that nothing we've done for the past 20 years has any predictive value, has any scientific value, and he quit. And oddly enough, Noah still continues using his models, using his information uh, to predict hurricanes, to give the annual NOAA hurricane prediction report. But uh, right. the, the issue is that this is the garbage science that's pawned off on the public. And these Italian scientists, I guarantee you, did not have Tier 1 good information and even the tier one people probably have a tough time predicting hurricane or well, predicting a tornado or even I'm in sorry, tier one the problem is compartmentalization one high tier right. one compartmentalized group of scientists may not communicate with another scientific group of a different specialty or discipline or a different department or agency or a different country so right. tier one science in russia or japan may not be communicating or if they are they're highly compartmentalized right and competitive on their own level uh, so, you know, this is really a complex topic, but I see this as an effort to destroy the credibility of Tier 2 science and to knock these scientists down a notch. Um, back in the mid-90s, a guy named Dan Golden came into NASA from the security agencies of the government, and his job was to put the lid on NASA. Um, to uh, make the all lid. the scientists, <laughs> yeah, well, basically make all Beat the Beat them down. Yeah, so made the scientists at NASA sign non-disclosure agreements and basically gag orders. They could not go up to a microphone and say anything uh, freely. Uh, and so they, they were basically, anything they wanted to say had to go through release agencies. There's uh, one at JPL, there's one at Goddard, and these scientists know they cannot just say something. Uh, but uh, and that was basically putting the lid on tier two science, so that right, it was yeah. totally controlled. That if these people discovered something, or say one of them decided that they agreed with me and my scientific principles, that they couldn't just go up to a microphone and say that. Well, uh, uh, Dr. McCanny, Professor McCanny, if you had, uh, let's say, X number of billions of dollars to do earthquake prediction. You could probably come up with a half dozen technologies that, if strung together, could start to at least gather data to get some predictive models. And then you could have statistical analysis to see how accurate and modify your model dependent on that data to look at the specific parameters. We don't have a conjoint international project like that. We don't have anything that's open disclosure to the public or tier two scientists. And there's very smart people out in the public too that might look at the data from a fresh perspective and say, did you ever look at this or that? And that might have a very great bearing on whether or not you look at the data differently to actually get a better predictive model. So uh, when we come back, I want to hear your response, because I think it's important we understand science is under attack. It's also being compartmentalized. It's being black opt. I call it bopped. And uh, that ties in with a lot of the disinformation about many, many issues. Back to the Neutral Medical Report, Professor James McCanny, his website, jmccsci.com. Professor McCanny, we asked you that question before the break about what would you do if you had billions of dollars, thousands of scientists, lay over a project that would do something like earthquake prediction and storm prediction. These are two major disasters that we are really ramped up since the 2004 uh, uh, day after Christmas super tsunamis that occur in Indonesia. And extreme weather and extreme earthquakes and volcanoes are increasing everywhere on the planet. We need to have predictive models that will be able to get people out of harm's way. And we need to not have politicking of the issue and scientists persecuted or literally bashed for Tier 2 science because they don't have access to the data. Or even if they had partial models, they're not getting proper funding or allowed to be collaborated with other scientists or the public. So uh, if you had the money, what would you do? I would uh, absolutely, this can be done, but we're starting so far behind the curve. Um, uh, let me just give an example. Once I was at an American Geophysical Union meeting, and a scientist speaking was giving a talk about solar activity models that they were working on. 
And so anyway, he got done with his talk, and he said, "We and when we get done with all the models, we always send them up to the military for them to analyze. And so finally, somebody at the end of the talk says, well, what did the military say to you about your model? And he said, oh, they never respond to us, and we don't know if they use it or if it's good or it's bad or, or what they do with it. They never respond. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> in other words, this is a dysfunctional communication system that's not good for national security, it's not good for security of the planet, and it actually literally uh, holds all to say, the tier two scientists as the peak of access to knowledge for new graduates wanting to go to learn astrophysics or plasma physics uh, or chemistry or engineering or any science base, and they actually don't have access to the tier one science giant database that's been built basically with a military industrial intelligence complex. It's very, very dangerous to do this. Yeah, and, and the military, of course, do it because that's their role. They have to keep it national security. Uh, so uh, it's, it's just a strange, bizarre situation. But the, I, And I've known scientists personally, very good scientists that come out young with a Ph.D., and you know that they're good scientists, they're sharp, and all of a sudden they just don't talk anymore. Oh, yeah, what happens is they get picked up, what I've been told, and they do this, uh, with the Ph.D. candidates all the way from honors degrees to master's degrees to Ph.D. candidates, and you'll have some agency kind of calling through and finding who is the really, really bright biophysicist and astrophysicist and whatever, an engineer, and then all of a sudden you see a personality change where they're, they've been black opt, I call bopped. They're no longer going to talk because even before they graduate or finish their master's or Ph.D. thesis, they're on a fast track to go to a special program where they're never going to publish anything while working for the military or these special projects on any public journals. It all goes for internal use for the military industrial intelligence complex. Disturbing, isn't it? Dr. McKenney, are you still there? I think, we, I think we maybe have lost our connection. Want to expand on this a little bit? Um, <clears throat> what what we're talking about here ties in with the whole idea of science. For example, the other day I had a real good discussion before the program with uh, the head of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And the words of Dr. Ron Klatz, MD, founder of the A4M, which is now trained over 26,000 doctors and 580,000 plus health professionals worldwide, and is virtually in every first and second world country on the planet, uh, is if something works, governments, not just in America, but in other countries and jurisdictions, will try to stop it. In other words, if you have technology to make people live to be 150 to 200 years of age and be healthful, we call the elderly. If you have technologies to reduce the carbur to improve the carburetion of cars so it doesn't pollute and it gets 200 miles per gallon, forget it. That patent will be bought up and hidden. And if scientists go and they get these non-disclosure agreements like NASA scientists and they discover something on Mars or the Moon or something about technology or operations that are black op military ops as part of their their research or just interaction. They've been basically bopped, so they can't talk to the public. So the public are kept like mushrooms uh, in the dark and, and fed BS. So, Professor McKinney, this is a very dangerous thing for our civilization. I call it the purposeful bifurcation of civilization starts with a bifurcation of scientific information because science is now a factor in what I call the, the recreation of human civilization. And without proper access to science, our civilization will bifurcate into a superculture and an infraculture. And that superculture is a military industrial complex. It's like Gattaca. And the infraculture is all the rest of us thinking, well, we can't predict. So we just sit there waiting for a tsunami or earthquake to hit us when the technology could have been developed or it may be developed, but they're not going to tell us. Right. Well, you understand that uh, there's the, the very top level here is that these scientists work for the world controllers. And uh, once they're opted into that, see, they don't understand that. All they know is that they get to work with the good equipment. They think that they're working for some agency within the government and have no clue that their information can be used against the public. Well, right. Uh, and some of them know when they get deep enough, they get patched. Have you heard of that technology before? No. What it is, is uh, if you get really deep into the blackout projects, they give you a patch of a... Of a, uh, of a 
that was put physically on your body. And if you don't get your next patch in 72 hours, you go into a very violent death. Uh, so it's, in other words, it's additional insurance. They now have things like kill chips, so they can have a special kill chip, which basically, if you send it to a specific RFID signal, that kill chip will release a micro dosage of a lethal neurotoxin, and you go into a neurotoxic shock and die. So people say that can happen. That's science fiction. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. The when you have literally limitless budgets and you call the smartest people in history over a century or more, and you have access to ancient records going back thousands of years that have been sequestered by secret orders of societies passed on to what I call the global elite. They this this cabal of evil and scientific sequestration of knowledge is very very dangerous. Yeah, it's very real, and, uh, well, we could go into that for a long time, but the, the issue with the scientists uh, in Italy, I just think that they're being buttonholed and uh, used as a uh, an example that puts other Tier 2 scientists on, on uh, basically, on mourning. That they right, cannot... It's it, exactly, and it also tells us that whether it's energy technology, because energy is money. I mean, the current money system we have really is based on oil, and oil is energy. So if you use energy as a currency of the world, and you have technologies that could literally get 200 to 300 miles per gallon, could allow us to get energy from a vacuum, could have all kinds of things like you know geothermal energy pumps and all kinds of technology out there. You, literally any country on earth would have enough energy to provide whatever food they want, whatever goods and transportation with minimal or no pollution. We have a society that basically wants to have want. It's the old British idea. If you create want, if you keep the resources down, if you make the population poor and destitute, you can control them. And destitute of information is one of the primary things that they want to do. Uh, I remember back in 1977 when I wanted to apply at UCLA to work at the VA Wadsworth Hospital under Dr. Tortolat, and I got accepted as his really senior resident PhD candidate. And then one project was to work on the World MS Tissue Brain Repository Immunology Lab, and the other four projects were the Super Soldier Project. So after I'd had my security clearance and they actually brought me through all this stuff, I said, this is like sci-fi craziness. They had one CT scan implanter designed specifically for Dr. Tortolet that could put microwires in the brains of prisoners from California prisons to commute or reduce their sentences. And this is technology that in 1977 would be considered space age. Now in 2012, people would think that won't exist in 2050. But it did. And the fact is what we're doing is we are killing our civilization by cutting off access to tier two scientists for this information and the public. So public policy, politicians have no idea that there's no need for shortage of food, energy, or predictive technology to stop space rocks, super quakes, extreme weather, tsunamis, all these things are within the purview that if we put the resources in place and have full access, we can do it. back. Uh, Jim, let's change the uh, course for a minute. We want to talk about strategic defense of the Earth. You're one of the top scientists in dealing with the issue of plasma physics of approaching comets. We've got this uh, approach that's coming by of this major comet and that, of course, we can't get accurate information. The NASA says it's 25 kilometers across, very big size, going to pass by uh, Mars at about 25 lunar distances sometime around October 3rd in that window. Uh, could have major plasma effects on a number of planets, especially Mars. Mars is going to pass through the tail of the comet. We have this DA2012 DA Sorry, 2012 DA14, a fairly large object, 197 kilometers across. It's coming by on my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday! Next February, that's going to pass at least 5,000 uh, miles above the Earth. But the problem is that they they don't allow us to have access since May because they black opt all the project. Any narrow space objects now are considered classified, so Tier 2 scientists can't get access to even say, well, the predictive models can keep on saying that this object's getting closer and closer. 
when they start re- re- putting the data out a few years ago, it was 100,000 miles from Earth, about half a lunar distance, and now it's down to 5,000 miles. So something really is bad happening here when they continue to massage, manipulate, and filter the data so we can't even ask the right questions anymore. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the data acquisition is, uh, as far as the public is concerned, is non-existent. And clearly, if something major is going to happen, the public simply won't know about right. it. They won't. They won't hear about it. Uh, and uh, that's just the way it is. Comet C2012 S1 uh, is going to come by Mars next uh, uh, October 3rd at a distance of around. Um, uh, about 26 lunar distances, which is pretty close, which will put the uh, it'll put the comet or put Mars within the coma of the comet, and so that's going to cause some very interesting activity. Uh, and this being a big comet, not a little Halley's kind of comet, but a big comet, uh, the question is uh, what's going to happen here. So. Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah. It, it, and of course, well, they can't hide the fact that they can't hide it in the sky. It'll be 15 times brighter than the moon uh, for quite a period. It won't just be October 3rd. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going uh, to be uh, keeping track of that, but about mid-September in the early morning sky, you'll be able to see in the east, the early morning sky, put this on your calendar, everybody, you'll be able to see the comet. By then it should be pretty big, and the planet Mars in the morning sky and what i suspect is they may start interacting electrically then that i think it would be phenomenal if the whole world could wake up early in the morning and see the comet interacting with mars something that the ancients talked about something that standard science is denying and i want to see how nasa tries to uh, cover it up when the whole world can see this and say well that's not really happening or this is a little snowball doing this uh, they're going to have a hard time doing that. Now, there's an interesting question, Zabul. You did a lot of work on the in, in the questions and areas on your website and your radio show, which the people can listen to as well on uh, Jim McCanny Science, is the nature of space. And the space we're going through now has a different density of particles, a different density of gases, a different density of cosmic, cosmic background radiation, zeta particles, muons, uh, uh, you know, all these other things going on, and apparently, as we cross, which takes 30 years through the galactic plane, which occurs every 62 million years, we're actually in the process of do that, doing that transition, uh, and we're moving into a different zone of space that's north of the galactic plane. Uh, have you done any research on this in terms of what it'll do in terms of plasma physics of the sun and planets that have, of course, our Earth is a plasma reactor, which is a nuclear reactor that creates a geomagnetic effect because of the nuclear reaction occurring in the bowels of the earth interacting with the giant iron core so how is how is the nature of space having effects on weather like nuclei micronuclei for stimulating weather uh, geomagnetic effects plasma effects in the sun the decreased solar spots or the increased chances of a major solar storm occurring like 2013 they're saying is the high point for solar cycle 24 um, will that space in other words affect have in the next say years and decades major negative effects on our planet and what kind uh, well I'm not a big proponent of the galactic plane concept just because uh, we're it's, it's hard to define the galactic plane uh, exactly where it is but the in around 1995 I was working with some Russian scientists uh, in the Novosibirsk uh, University with atmospheric scientists uh, right. Dr. Dmitry, uh, uh, Alexei Dmitry, specifically in his group, and they started to notice effects that they could see and detect at the edge of the solar system, and uh, indicating that we were heading into a different type of, uh, of space. Yeah. Of yeah. space. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so yeah. this has been going on for a while. Oh yeah, well, uh, it's not wait, we're not one, one moment. Like people think December twenty first, the yeah, research articles like I have, a, a, it's yeah. a thirty year period. What I dug from my research, which is actual scientific articles from Russian and European and American and other scientists, they're in the public domain, so people can do this themselves. And I may post up a special site over at Clay and Iron on it. 
that there is a galactic plane. We are transitioning through it, but it takes 30 years or so to go through it. It's an area where there's a bull shock wave of gamma rays. There's an increase in particle density, and there's a change in what's called the torsion field, which is the, if you want to call it the space-time, the shape of space-time is, in other words, what I'm trying to say. And uh, that really is happening. And that there's these change in particles increase rainfall, which, by the way, can drive you into an ice age because the micronuclei of cosmic particles can actually trigger off rainfall. Because rainfall occurs around, you know, the things that cause the seeding of clouds. Well, the, the, the solar cycle we're in right now is fairly weak. Uh, it's right. One of the, weak, one of the weaker ones weak. we've we, had. We, is, exactly, which is why, of course, it's during the weak cycles when you can have the biggest storms, too. Well, yeah, and it's hard, very hard to predict uh, exactly what might happen uh, with yeah. the solar storm. In fact, the comet C-2000... Called S1, um, it's one of the opposing factors. It's going to come very close to Mars, but uh, where you have a very weak magnetic, uh, weak uh, uh, solar capacitor, this capacitor that builds up around the sun due to solar wind. So it was very much depleted when Hillbop was here. So anyway, the, ah, okay. So in other words, like a spark gap of a Van de Graaff generator, or you run across the carpet and you have spark jumps, you depleted it. But this comet could literally cause a giant discharge uh, of the of the uh, what, what's called the uh, chronosphere, the, the 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 area around the sun. It could it could be a plasma discharge across that. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, and uh, so I'm going to keep a watch on this. The actual first interaction came this past Sunday. The comet oh, really? had a very a very good electrical uh, connection with the planet Venus. But I couldn't see any uh, actual data because Venus is so bright that it just drowns out everything in the sky. What would you see? Uh, would you see a radio signal if you looked at a radio telescope? Or what would you see? My yeah, guess is a plasma discharge would see, or like a radio signal from the discharge, right? Yeah, you might see some actual uh, uh, radio signals, uh, things like that. NASA probably has some equipment where they can see the, the nose side of Venus and increase in x-rays. Uh, situation like that, but uh, um, I didn't observe anything myself just because uh, Earth viewing, I had extremely clear viewing, but Venus is so bright that any small effects would be literally drowned out by the the light of, just like the light of the full moon in the atmosphere. Oh, but okay. uh, these, these electrical uh, interactions between the comet and planets will continue over the next year, so I'll keep you updated on that. <clears throat> Uh, so if you theorize, and being scientifically not you know, going out on a, on a limb, uh, we're going to see effects. The effects will probably cause a change in the atmosphere of the particles around Mars. They could cause effects on other planets like Venus or the Sun. Uh, and, of course, they're predicting that solar cycle 24 next year could be the highest risk of a major solar storm. Well, uh, yeah, they, the, 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 the peak may run out as far as uh, 2014. Of this next solar cycle, oh, okay. so, uh, but uh, it's, so far it's been really, really benign. Let's put it that way. And oh, yeah, very, very low uh, solar sunspot, and of course that might also explain the decreased temperatures. The temperatures are dropping around the world, which is why we have the Antarctic ice fields increasing dramatically, despite them saying it's global warming. Exactly. Yeah, this, we're in an actual cooling episode right now. Remarkable discussion, especially the one dealing with the uh, Tier 2 science. Uh, Professor McKinney, have to have you go on at least twice a month because these issues are going to become uh, very big here in the next uh, couple of uh, weeks, years, and months. Thank you for coming on the program today. We will have you back on soon. Coming up uh, tomorrow, of course, we have a uh, major uh, update with uh, Tim Alexander and Chris Harris on what's going on in Fukushima. And, of course, our preparedness and earth changes hour on Friday. Thank you, Professor McKinney. Amazing Thank material you. to cover today. Yeah, that was uh, some interesting topics and uh, more to come. Absolutely. Thank you.